Thanks very much, Dr. Day. It is indeed an honor and a distinct pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. A. Wesley Burks, who is Professor in Chief of the Division of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at Duke University, which is in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Burks graduated from the University of Central Arkansas, which is in Conway, and then completed his medical degree at the University of Arkansas in, for medical sciences in Little Rock. And yes, he does know Bill Clinton. He completed his pediatric residency at Arkansas Children's Hospital and then went on to do his fellowship in allergy and immunology at Duke University. Dr. Burks's research interests are primarily related to adverse reactions to food. His studies have focused on developing a better understanding of the mechanism driving food allergy, improved diagnostic methods for food allergy, and the development of treatment for the same. He is funded by many organizations, not the least of which is the NIH. Dr. Burks is very uh, modest and his biography that he sent along to settle many publications. But a quick PubMed search, he's authored or co-authored over 150 peer-reviewed uh, articles, including publications in such prestigious journals as the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, and the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, which now has an impact factor of 9.77, so just should, gives you an indication of how increasingly important this field is to uh, medicine. He currently serves on the board of directors for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and we are very delighted to have him with us here today. So, we're going to do Dr. Burks. I'd like to thank Ann and the others, Dr. Day and the others in the division here, for the opportunity to come. It's my first time to Kingston, and, and even though it was a little foggy yesterday, it's still nice to be here and see the, the city. So, I appreciate this opportunity. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to have a discussion with you uh, and base it on a case that we partially talked about last night, but to talk about how the immune system is involved both in a very positive way in helping us get rid of infections that we all face, but also can turn on us at times and cause significant systemic reactions that are sometimes unexpected. So to begin with, just a normal faculty disclosure, there is one that's pertinent. This Allertain is a company that sponsored some of the research with the recombinant proteins that we'll talk about later. So what I'd like to be able to do is to look at the broad field of allergy, particularly food allergy, and talk about the different types of immune-mediated reactions. Most of us think about allergy as skin tests and IgE and blood tests, and it's really broader than that. To talk about the appropriate diagnosis, and then a little bit about the current, but more about what we think, where we might be going in the future for treatment. So I'm going to start off with a patient, and I think this patient illustrates two points. Uh, one would be the power of the immune system. That this is a patient, as I'll describe in just a second, that had an allergy and had an exposure literally to less than one milligram of protein. And we'll put that in context of what you typically eat on a daily basis are grams of food. So less than one gram and caused a life-threatening allergic response. So this is a 19-year-old female. She was at a sorority party and she ate a bite of a Rice Krispie treat, which is a cookie made of Rice Krispie cereal and marshmallow cream. And we'll come back to this to talk about why she reacted the way she did. She had immediate symptoms of throat itching, hives on her face, wheezing, this sense of impending doom. And if you read the, the allergy textbooks or the medicine textbooks, that sense of impending doom is a very real phenomenon. Even though she'd never had a bad reaction before, they have this aura when the reaction begins that something really bad is going on, and they'll describe it. I remember the first time I experienced this was as a fellow. One of my fellow fellows decided to volunteer for a study, and he had, unfortunately, too many skin tests applied, and he had a systemic anaphylactic response. And he looked up from the floor that we all rushed in to see, and he was laying down at that point, and he goes, something's wrong, something really bad's wrong. And that's before we'd studied anaphylaxis, so he didn't know what the right words were. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a real thing that they experience. Not by itself, it'll be in conjunction with other symptoms, but it's a very real phenomenon. So they called 911, she vomited, she wound up having a respiratory arrest, intubated, was intubated for three days, and then recovered uneventfully, so to speak. So you can see the power of the immune system, how it causes an immediate hypersensitivity response that is far beyond what we think often that should or could happen. So in this patient, she had a really a, a normal family history. The significant things about her family history are that her mother, her mother had different types of allergic disease. And I think the take on point here would be that for families that have allergic disease, then they transmit genetically, obviously, allergic disease to their offspring. 
So in the general population, it's about 20% of families, of patients will have allergic disease. If one family member, so it's mother, dad, or a sibling has it, it goes up to around 40%. Two family members, it's about 60%. And if the mother has allergic rhinitis, as in this case, the father has asthma, then the child is at risk for an allergic disease, not the same disease that the parents had. So it's important in that concept. Often families will tell you about a grandmother or an aunt somebody else in the family and that may be interesting and you allow them to talk about it, but it has no pertinence to the allergic disease that we're talking about. So this child had atopic dermatitis or eczema. For many in medicine, you might not have seen this disease since you're in medical school and we'll come back to that. And this child also at 12 months of age had a bite of pancakes for the first time. He had an acute immediate reaction with urticaria. Her mom recognized that it was probably something she ate, but she really didn't know what it was or why it happened. So now I want to show you a picture of a child, a couple of kids that have atopic dermatitis. This is a genetically inherited atopic skin rash that occurs about 50% of the time in the first year of life, 90% of the time by age 5. For those of you that are adults that still have atopic dermatitis, it often localizes on the hands and feet, sometimes still in the antecubital or the popliteal fossa. The hallmarks of it are the puritis, so it's an erythematous puritic rash that is chronic. And if there are genetic defects that we understand better now that help play a part in the disease, but it's certainly part of the allergic diseases that helps in the sensitization process. So from the broad picture, we're talking about food allergy in the context here today, that this is a study from the CDC in the U.S. that came out almost a year ago now that looked at the prevalence of food allergy in the U.S. And it's consistent with other studies in the last 10 years. And so the overall prevalence of food allergy in North America for children less than school age, so less than six, is about six to eight percent. And that's vastly different than we thought 20 years ago. For adults, it's about three to four percent. And again, it's pretty consistent in any of the recent 10 year studies. Again, it's very different. If you'd trained in medicine 30 years ago, you would have been taught truly, that's what people thought at that time, less than one percent of the population. And for people that think they have it, they don't really have it. It's all in their mind. That's, that's the prevailing opinion at that point. And still in the practice of medicine, if you look at some of the better medical journals, like I read Sports Illustrated or Red Book or whatever you want to read, then about 30% of families think that they have food allergy. But the scientific reality is 4% of adults and 6 to 8% of kids. So where you operate in medicine is in that chasm between a lot of people thinking they have food allergy, some people have it that's real and can be like this girl that we just talked about, but others not really having the disease. And how do you operate in that chasm there without walking in and saying, I know you're not allergic to all these foods, but helping families get foods back in their diet, helping a patient get foods in their diet. A clinic that, that we have that's 99% food allergy, we put more foods back in than we take out because of that public perception and the scientific reality. So what are other things that we've learned in the last 20 years about this field of allergic diseases. So children that have atopic dermatitis, the one I just described, like the patient we're talking about, almost half of them have food allergy that triggers their dermatitis. It doesn't cause the disease, and that's a very big distinction. And I'll use the example of, if you have asthma, you have exacerbating factors, viral infections, exercise, other things that will make you wheeze if you have asthma. It's the same thing for atopic dermatitis. You have atopic dermatitis, and then Food allergy early in life may exacerbate the disease, but you take the foods out, your disease gets better, but it doesn't go away because it doesn't cause the disease. It's an exacerbating factor, and it's a huge point that kids, families, adults understand. So if you're allergic, what foods? It's a small number. Milk, egg, and peanut are about 80%. Add in wheat, soy, fish is a group, which would be the fin fish, like cod and other similars that are all fairly similar. The shellfish, the tree nuts, sesame, you know, those eight or nine foods are about 95% of food reactions. So it's a relatively small number. It's not that you can't be allergic to other foods, but it's really, really much, much, much less common. So the patient that comes into the clinic with the scroll that's filled out with all the foods that they're allergic to, then what you generally can do is begin to work through these foods to get foods back in their diet, because they're not going to be allergic to all of them. They would have misrecognized or there's symptoms of eczema being caused by foods or other serendipitous reactions that really truly weren't food reactions. So we also know that children that have atopic dermatitis, like our patient we're talking about today, 
About three quarters going to develop allergic rhinitis, half going to develop asthma. We were talking last night. It used to be called the atopic triad. More often now, we might refer to it as the atopic marathon, because once it starts, some form of that disease is going to be there almost for life. So now I'm going to digress for just a minute and put this patient aside and come back to talk about oral tolerance. And you'll understand later as we go through the hour why this would be important. So oral tolerance is a, a term in immunology that talks about the, the specific, I can talk, specific suppression of either the cellular and or humoral, typically both of them, immune system by the first administration of the antigen orally versus any other route of administration. So if that happens, your immune response is very different. And I'll, I'll illustrate this in this next picture. If you have a, a mouse and if you inject the antigen, it can be a bacteria, virus, whatever you want to inject, wait a few weeks and inject again, they have an immune response. This is a normal response that you and I have to H1N1, to strep, whatever else it might be, a foreign antigen. The food that you eat is a foreign antigen. It's not any different. Our immune response is going to be like that if we are exposed like we would be to the bacteria and viruses. On the other hand, if you take a mouse, this is a new mouse, new mice that haven't been exposed and you give them the antigen orally for the first time, wait a few weeks and expose them by injection, they're tolerant. It's a hugely different immune response. Their cellular response is muted. Their immunoglobulin response is not a normal IgM to, I mean, IgM to IgG than the IgE response. It's very different if you give it orally for the first time. But in what studies, again, 50 to 60 years ago, first recognized that if you take the T cells from this animal here, transfer them to this animal, but don't expose them to the antigen, wait, inject again, they're tolerant. So we know now these cells are more in the regulatory cells that we'll talk about. So this concept has been around a long time. It was described in the native North American Indians 100 years ago, people understood it. And then some of the first animal studies were about 50 years ago. The difficulty that we have in understanding human disease is that when does this first oral antigen exposure occur to foods? Is it in utero? Is it during breastfeeding? Is it in the first few months of life? When does it actually happen? And that's the difficulty that we have in predicting disease, but also trying to prevent disease. So if we come back and kind of put this in a, a big paradigm, there's a, a transforming growth factor beta, which is one of the cytokines. If we look at classically in immunology, they talk about high dose and then low dose tolerance. And if you have a mouse, we can talk about the milligrams that are high dose. And if you have a mouse, we'll talk about the milligrams that are low dose. Again, translating that into human disease, we don't know when the exposure occurs to cause oral tolerance. And we don't know really what high dose and low dose because we can't differentiate that in humans. But if you look at high dose in animals, you get apoptosis of the cell. So the cells die. If you look at lower dose, then they have regulatory cells, which is like the di diagram I showed you, TGF-beta being somewhat of a final common mediator of both pathways. So that, that if we orally are exposed to that antigen the first time, these are the types of things that will happen. Again, in a very different response than you have if you inject the antigen or topically apply the antigen or inhale the antigen in the first exposure. So now we're going to come back to our patient. We're going to walk through her life and see why it's important uh, in the illustration of some of the points that we'll talk about. She was two now. Her mother gave her a bite of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It just happened to be the first time. She had immediate symptoms. The, uh, her symptoms related to the skin, the GI, and the respiratory tract. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. Her mother gave her Benadryl and antihistamine. She recognized that it was probably an allergic reaction this time. And she went to her primary care doctor. They began to look for IgE that we'll come back and talk about. She was seen by an allergist and had testing done. And we'll come back to talk about this again. And she was given the diagnosis of peanut and egg allergy, obviously, and then had the appropriate educational information, which is avoidance of the food. And then we'll see you in follow up. And we'll come back to see why those are important. So what we understand now, I, I think, it, and it truly really has changed in the last 30 years, that certainly the public perception of food allergy, the public perception, particularly peanut allergy, is vastly different. And that 30% number I quoted a few minutes ago has been there since the 1970s, truly. If you look at the NIH publications from the early 1980s, that chasm between the public perception and the beginnings of the scientific reality were very, very different. But we do know that in good studies that the sensitization rate for 
peanuts alone has tripled in 20 years and the evidence of allergic disease has doubled in that time, same time frame. There's recent evidence that it, the plateau, it's begun to plateau, but certainly the, in a public awareness standpoint, it continues to grow for good and bad reasons. They're presenting to the doctor earlier in life than they were 10 years ago, certainly. And I think an important point, particularly as you take care of adolescents and adults, who are, who are the group of individuals that are at risk for future systemic reactions? Because that's really what you want to know as you take care of a patient. How should I take care of them? Do I tell them to avoid the food and if you have a reaction, come see me? Or do I need to give them something to take care of that reaction more immediately? So for someone that has had a future I mean, a past systemic reaction like the adolescent we talked about, they certainly deserve epinephrine to be able to available to them at all times, some type of auto injector. That if they have peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish, they really are at risk for future systemic reactions. About 85% of the deaths from foods are peanuts or tree nuts, for reasons I don't know that we entirely understand. And then those that have, you know, pretty good mild, persistent, moderate asthma, they're really at risk because the deaths are from respiratory symptoms after food ingestion. And we'll come back to that in a few months. So now to take the broader view of allergic disease, particularly food allergy. So again, if you think about allergic rhinitis, sometimes thinking about asthma, food allergy, you begin to think about IgE immediately. And really I'd like to broaden that to talk about food allergy is an immune mediated reaction to a food. There are those that have IgE as the cause of it that we'll primarily talk about today. And then there are others that have non-IgE mediated symptoms. As an internist, Probably you're not going to see the latter group, the non-IgE disease, because that's primarily in childhood. You know, the classic prototype is food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome. These are children that three to four hours after the ingestion of their soy or infant formula they have massive amounts of vomiting and later diarrhea. They have no respiratory, no skin symptoms, and it's, it's truly immune-mediated if it's not caused by IgE. They outgrow in the first two to four years of life. The other group that we'll concentrate on today are those that have IgE-mediated symptoms. And again, they're concentrated on the skin, the GI, and the respiratory tract. Skin symptoms, hives, whelps, whatever you might call them, an itchy red rash that occurs immediately, shortly after exposure. GI symptoms of severe, significant abdominal pain, not mild generally, vomiting or diarrhea later. And then respiratory symptoms can be upper, but that's typically pretty not isolated by itself. So we're really talking about lower respiratory symptoms. So throat, lungs, coughing, wheezing, voice changes, inability to speak, all that happens as part of the immune response that we'll talk about. So this is a, a cartoon, and in, in this cartoon, again, there's the, the top row and the bottom row to divide it and trying to go through what we might understand. So what I'd like to show is how the sensitization happens. And sensitization means that you're exposed to that antigen and by the right timing in a genetically predisposed individual, you'll make IgE. That's different than having disease. So it means that you make IgE, you have IgE, and that's what happens in sensitization. A subsequent time point, second, tenth, hundredth time you're exposed, then you may have disease. But that the presence of IgE does not mean disease, and that's a huge distinction as you think about any of the allergic diseases, whether it's eczema, allergic rhinitis, asthma, insect sting allergy, food allergy, drug allergy, the presence of IgE means that you have IgE. That's what you take out of it. It doesn't mean clinical disease. You have to put everything else together to mean disease. So what happens is that you have the antigen recognized here, and in the allergic field we call the antigen an allergen just to really confuse people. So then they're exposed to the antigens, and the dendritic cells take them out, they present them to the T cell in a normal immune response. The Th2 is the, the type of lymphocyte that would be by genetic predisposition. You have a phenotype that you respond by making IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and that causes your B cell to make allergen-specific IgE. If you're allergic to birch pollen here, then you make allergen-specific IgE to birch pollen. And then the IgE will sit on this mast cell here. On that mast cell, there may be allergen-specific IgE for birch, for peanut, for dust mite, for cat, whatever you might be allergic to. It's not one mast cell that's peanut and one mast cell that's cat. It's a mast cell with multiple specificities. So your total IgE is made up of individual component IgEs to all the things I just described. So those of us that don't have allergic disease, our IgE will be between 0 and 50. 
the allergic population, the overlap is like this. So if this is a normal population, this is the allergic population, there's an overlap here. But the total IgE is made up of component parts of those individual IgEs. So now the bottom row is at a subsequent time point, you eat the food. Same thing happens for allergic rhinitis, insect sting allergy, drug allergy. You're exposed to the allergen, it bridges IgE, and then that causes a response. And we'll talk about this, the mast cell now. The mast cell, where is the mast cell? It's in the skin, the GI, and the respiratory tract. So one EF symptoms related to what we're talking about today because the mast cells are in the skin, the GI, and the respiratory tract. So you, you ingest the allergen, in this case it bridges these two molecules, then a lot of things happen to this cell and signaling at that point, the IgE receptors co-aggregate, then immediately you have mediators that are released at that site. So you have mast cells in the skin, the histamine tryptase are immediately released, you have immediate symptoms. You also have cell signaling that later you'll have other types of mediators produced, the leukotrienes, the cytokines, the later phase response. That's important for asthma, it's important for allergic rhinitis, it's also important for food allergy. But about a third of families, third of patients like I described have a late phase response two to four hours later because of this late phase response that you have in the mast cell itself. So you can see the different mediators are involved. So as you begin to think through to understand the disease, again, we're mast cells, mast cells have IgE on them, then the allergen comes, as you ingest the food, it's absorbed into the bloodstream and it gets quickly out to the mast cells. There were fascinating experiments 70 years ago when they first began to understand the disease. That they took individuals that were allergic to fish, and that was their prototype, and they took the serum from that individual and injected it into someone, did, did a blab like an intradermal skin test. That person was not allergic to fish, and that person ate fish. And then at that site where they injected the serum, it was a huge wheel and flare because you injected IgE from that person into my skin. I eat the fish, it's absorbed, and it goes out to that site. What we understand now is that that substance is IgE. They didn't know what it was, and they knew there was something in the serum that they could inject that would transfer the ability to react to something like that. So it, it underscores the importance of the mass cell in this. So now what do we learn? We know the difference between sensitization and disease. So if you do a lot of skin tests or you do a lot of blood tests, you'll have a lot of IgE. People will make IgE, but you have to put it in the context of, of their clinical history to know whether it really indicates disease or it indicates sensitization. And that's the important distinction. We know that a negative skin test, particularly for foods, is a really good negative predictor. If I ingest milk and peanut at the same time and I have immediate symptoms, because my symptoms will be temporally related to ingestion, literally seconds to minutes like the 19-year-old we discussed, 99% of the time within two hours of ingestion. It's not four hours or eight hours or 12 hours later for this type of disease. So if I have milk and peanut and I have a reaction, which food was it? A skin test, a negative skin test in milk says it wasn't milk almost all the time. The positive value of a skin test in general is about 50% without a history. With a history that's appropriate, then it should be the positive value should be much, much, much higher. So it's a, it helps you, it's a piece of that puzzle. If you put the puzzle together, about 85 to 90% of it is your clinical history, then you use the right diagnostic testing. If it's a child that has vomiting and no skin or respiratory, it could be that f highs that I talked about, IgE testing really isn't appropriate. For a 19-year-old like this that has an acute symptoms after ingestion of a food, that positive skin test confirms that it was that food that they had. So now I'm going to talk about just the broad discussion for allergic disease in general because it, the model that we're talking about today is food allergy, but really the principles, the pathophysiology and understanding of the disease really is pertinent to any of the allergic diseases, whether it's allergic rhinitis, asthma, and allergic causes of that, insect sting allergy, drug allergy, same types of phenomena. So avoidance of the allergen if it's feasible. So for foods, it may be feasible in some case. If you're allergic to birch pollen and you live here, I probably, probably really can't avoid it. It's going to be pretty here in the spring. And they're in you know, late August, September, as we were talking about earlier, you're going to be exposed to ragweed. Even if you stay inside, it's in the air. You can't get away from it. Medical therapy or pharmacologic therapy. For allergic rhinitis, it may be an antihistamine and an nasal steroid. For asthma, it may be an, a, a controller medication and an inhaled steroid. We don't have that for food allergy. We don't have any proactive preventive treatment to prevent disease now. And then immunotherapy in the general scheme of allergic disease, but for most, if these two aren't effective, then 
if you get to immune therapy, particularly for nasal allergic disease, you should be about 90% of the time better if you're treated appropriately. If you can identify what they're allergic to, they have seasonal symptoms here in, say, May, that may be birch pollen, and in September that may be ragweed. If you fail medical therapy and then you're put on immunotherapy with that, 90% of the time you should be better because of the specific immune response. So now just talking about coming back down to food allergy itself, the diagnosis, as I said, is 85 to 90% clinical history. What were the symptoms? The relationship to ingestion. And is it reproducible? Because an immune-mediated reaction within a few weeks to a few months is reproducible. Not exactly the same, but you don't have a reaction like this 19-year-old and then eat the same food a week later and not have a reaction. And then two weeks later, eat the food and have a reaction. So in your clinical history, is the reaction that they have symptoms from, is it consistent over a period of time? Not exactly the same, but do they have symptoms every time they're exposed? And if they don't, it's not really the food. It's a pretty good indicator. Over time, you outgrow disease. We'll talk about that, but not within a few weeks to months. Over years, you outgrow disease. So, and then the, the last part I put here, there are lay networks now. There's the uh, Anaphylaxis Canada group here in the, the U.S. There's the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network. They really have helpful information for families. If you allow them to or say that they're going to go out and Google it or whatever you want to do, on a search engine, they'll get millions of hits that almost a million of them aren't going to be really helpful. So you can guide them in their search for more information. So now we're going to come back to our girl. She's five, and she was eating in her friend's birthday party. This is a friend that she'd had since birth. Her parents, the mothers were good friends. The mother made some cookies. The original batch had peanuts in them. She took the spatula, put them aside, made a new batch, took that same spatula and turned them over. She ate a bite of that. And he, that's to illustrate the point that that's how much it took, a bite of this amount of peanut on a cookie that will cause significant symptoms. And you can see she had immediate symptoms suggestive of a systemic allergic response, which is not atypical. So her symptoms resolve with appropriate treatment. But that's the amount. But the, the thing I like to point out, though, is that it's by ingestion. She ate the food. She didn't smell it. She didn't touch it. She didn't walk in the room with it. The cookie didn't jump on her. She ate the food. Okay, that's important. Okay, so. Families, after they're diagnosed, they're going to have reactions, and you have to help them be prepared for it. This 19-year-old could have been told beforehand she's in the highly at-risk group for having a severe, systemic, life-threatening allergic reaction based on her clinical history. You would know that based on her history prior to this. So that, uh, some type of written plan for them is helpful, and it's, it's better to put something on paper that said, if A, these symptoms happen, you do B, if C happens, you do D. Don't let them try to make a medical decision in doing this. Not unlike an asthma action plan that you might have for your children, adolescents, or adults. It's straightforward. They know what they should be doing. We also know now that about 20% of children early in life that are diagnosed with peanut allergy will outgrow it. About 10% of children that have tree nut, fish, shellfish allergy will outgrow it. Small numbers, but that's a lot more than we thought 20 years ago. We used to think if you had it, you kept it for life. We also know that for those that have milk and egg, wheat and soy, almost all of those are outgrown by college. If we talked 10 years ago, I would have said by grade school, because that's what we thought, but it seems to last a little bit longer, or we have better studies to show how long it truly lasts. But the distinction is that if you're allergic to milk, egg, and peanuts, say early in life, you'll likely outgrow milk and egg, but you won't likely outgrow peanut. And that's pretty consistent from all the studies. So then to come back to the point about peanuts in the environment, there is a lot of the lay press, TV, magazines, newspapers about peanuts in the environment, peanut-free schools, peanut-free daycare, uh, peanut-free work environment. And the point of all of this, and it's illustrated in her history, that it really takes ingestion to have life-threatening symptoms, almost always. Uh, you might have symptoms if it touches you. You put peanut butter on this child, this adolescent, she'll have a reaction. She's allergic to it. She has IgE. She'll have hives or whelps, but it's not going to be a life-threatening or life-ending episode. All of the life-ending episodes, generally for peanuts, tree nuts, have been by ingestion. Certainly there are other foods that you can, by inhalation, have significant systemic symptoms. If you're going to a shrimp boil and you have asthma and you're allergic to shrimp and you inhale the, the steam that has the shrimp allergen in it, you can have symptoms. But that's not how people die. They die by ingestion. 
So now we're going to come back to our 19-year-old. So this is actually what happened to her. Her mother had given her Rice Krispie treats her whole life. That was a safe food for her to eat. She, she was uh, tolerating the Rice Krispies, the marshmallow cream that they made up. Her sorority sister actually put a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter in the Rice Krispie treats as she made them. It wasn't discolored, so she didn't think it was any different. She took one bite of it. So imagine a sheet of Rice Krispies, cereal, box of cereal, two tablespoons of peanut butter spread out over all that. She took one bite of it. That's how little protein it took to cause that serious, almost life-ending episode for this patient. So what do we understand from this? We know that there are individuals that will be at risk for, for likelihood of more serious, systemic, life-threatening, life-ending episodes. There's work going on now to better predict that, to look at the epitopes or stretches of amino acids that if I have IgE binding to that, I may be at risk for a future serious systemic reaction. We also know that, and this really applies to this patient that we're talking about, that there truly is an at-risk group. Those that are middle adolescents to middle 20s, those that have asthma, those that are peanut or tree nut allergic, and those that have had serious reactions before, not life-threatening necessarily. Those are the people where 85% of the deaths occur from. It's not a two-year-old, although it can happen, but it's really, really, really uncommon. But it's that 19-year-old that has that classic history. Those are the people those are the individuals that really are at risk for this severe life-threatening disease. We also know that really good studies over the last 15 years that the elevation of IgE or the size of the skin test, so the bigger the size of the skin test, generally the more IgE you have if you draw your blood, so in a serum test. That correlates not at all with the severity of reaction. So the higher your IgE, it doesn't mean more severe. So lots of families will be told, lots of adults will be told, well, your IgE is really severe because your peanut IgE is 80. You can't really say that. You can't predict that based on the size of the skin test or the elevation of IgE. And that's been pretty consistent in the last 10 years. So now we're going to talk what's going on right now, which is our perfect diagnosis and treatment, which is avoidance. And by the way, you'll probably react at some point. Here's what you do if you have an axial reaction. Now we're going to leave that because that's the right thing to do now. That's what I would suggest clinically it's done and talk about what might happen in the next three to five years, and then maybe even beyond that. And these types of treatment I picked, there could have been several that we would discuss today. There are allergen nonspecific, meaning treatment for any type of food allergy, and then those that are allergen specific. These same types of treatment though are going on for other allergic diseases, same prototypes. It's just that this particular model really sets itself up well for studying allergic disease because you have a closed system. You can feed a patient a food and they either react or they don't react. And you can tell about your therapy. If you study allergic rhinitis, what you have to do is you have to, to come to Kingston and you have to have patients in August and September and October fill out a diary. You have to put on top of the hospital this rotor rod, rod that collects ragweed and see what the ragweed counts are. And then you have to go on the patient's perception of the symptoms. You can't really put ragweed up your nose and do a challenge. But you can't have food, so it's a really closed system, and that's why I think it's ideal for the study of understanding the mechanism of the disease, but also the therapies, because you know you can either eat the food or you don't eat the food. And if you can't eat the food, you have some symptoms, and you can have a model that you can study these types of therapies. So with that in mind, anti-IG was one of the first one studies that's out on the market as omalizumab. It's anti any IgE, it's not just one specific IgE. Uh, it binds basically the FC receptor. Uh, it keeps it from binding to the receptor itself. It binds the FC portion, excuse me. It has been studied. Uh, it raises your threshold, but it's not going to be a treatment for the future. Uh, the next one is under traditional Chinese medicine or Chinese herbal medicine. Yeah, this is a, a series of studies that were started by Xunan Li at Mount Sinai about 10 years ago. She started out developing a peanut allergic mouse model, made mice allergic to peanuts, treated them with different concoctions of the herbs, and now through a series of about 10 years of studies, she now has this formulation that is in early clinical human studies. They've done the one month, the six month safety studies, the interventional studies are starting as we speak. And it down regulates the immune response, at least in the animal studies, significantly and the mice can be allergic to peanuts or peanuts and fish. They're all different ramifications of it. How it might work, I think, will be fascinating. And I mean, first, if it does, it is effective to dampen the immune response. But then how it might work, I think, will be fascinating. The next one we'll talk about are those children, and this is primarily in children, 
the studies that again have come out of Mount Sinai to look at the use of heat denatured protein as a type of therapy. Ten years ago, if we talked, we would have said, if you're allergic to milk or egg, then you totally avoid it from your diet. Some of those would have said, well, my child can tolerate a cooked egg in a cake or a casserole. But we would have said, you need to take it out of your diet. That continues to stimulate IgE and you will not grow it. So what Anya has done is to say, well, maybe we ought to leave that in the diet or put that in the diet to help you outgrow it in a way of a daily therapy or a weekly therapy. And that's what she, in fact, has done. So these are heat denatured proteins. And, and as an aside, in foods, what you generally have your reaction to, you make IgE to the linear sequence. If you're allergic to birch pollen, you make IgE to a conformational epitope in the birch pollen. It's not the linear sequence. So these individuals can tolerate heating the food, and then as they outgrow it, then it helps them to outgrow it. So that's how things have changed. This is in the last couple of years. Next prototype of therapy would be sublingual. For those of you that don't know this type of therapy, it's been used for allergic rhinitis around the world for the last 50 years. Taking a liquid concentrate of the allergen, taking a dropper and putting it underneath the tongue, holding it for two to three minutes and either spitting it out or swallowing it. In theory, it presents to the immune system and the upper airway very differently than it might if it's injected or if it's given orally. There are studies that have been done with different types of grass pollen, different types of tree pollen, primarily in Europe in the last 15 years. About half of Europe is using sublingual immunotherapy for allergic rhinitis now. Different in different countries, some much more than others. It's just now being studied for food allergy. We've done an open study, a second blinded and now a third blinded study to look. The difference between this and what I'll talk about in a minute, the other types of therapy will be oral, you're ingesting the food. This is sublingual. And then the other big difference is that the most that you can get out is probably two to three milligrams at a time sublingually. Orally, you can get grams in. So that's the distinction between the two. So we'll see what happens with this type of therapy. The next one we'll talk about is the concept, you know, this is a concept used for immunotherapy for allergic rhinitis, for other types of allergic disease. Can you re-engineer the protein to use for immune therapy? And I'm not talking here about making a, hy a hypoallergenic peanut to eat so that you can go to see the raptors and eat the hypoallergenic peanuts. That's not what we're talking about. That's really not feasible with current technology. But what you can do in theory is to take out from that protein the IgE binding sites and retain the T cell sites that might stimulate those regulatory cells. That's the concept. And this work was started about 20 years ago, identifying the three major of now eight allergens in peanut. So the concept is, I'll show you the picture. If this is an RH1, which is the scientific name for the major allergen, the first major allergen from peanuts. It's about 600 amino acids, and this is modeling that was done. So the idea is that can you identify the IgE binding sites, which I'll show you here, and make an amino acid substitution that will change IgE binding to that epitope. So it took about five years of work to identify the IgE binding and the T cell binding sites to Rh1, 2, and 3, and then go through each epitope at a time. So taking 10 amino acids, modifying one, each one to find 